uh, uh, that I will be discussing. Without objection, Ms. so ordered. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. A great deal of, of discussion, certainly this week and, and last, with the uh, announcement from the United States Preventative Services Task Force, the USPSTF, uh, the recommendations as they relate to, to mammograms and the recommendation that uh, women under the age of 50 um, do not need to be screened uh, until they, they reach age 50 and then uh, on attaining the age of 50 every other year after that. When these recommendations came out on the 16th of November, I, I think it's fair to say that they generated a, a level of controversy, a level of discussion, and really a level of, of confusion around the country uh, by women from all walks of life. I think for many, many years now, uh, women have operated under what we knew to be the standards, the protocols. If you had uh, a history of breast cancer in your family, obviously you, you took certain steps earlier, but the general recommendation that was out there, certainly the guidelines that we had been following, the assurances that we were seeking as women was that uh, we would be encouraged to engage in these screenings on, on an annual basis, um, and they gave us all a, a, a level uh, of confidence. When the, these new recommendations, these new guidelines came out then just a couple weeks ago, um, I, I, I really do think that the level of confusion, the level of anxiety that was raised um, because of this announcement brought a focus to, to some of what we are talking about here today when, when we discuss health care, health care reforms, and, and how the government, should the government be involved in, in our health care. Uh, I know that uh, I have received um, emails from, from friends, emails from relatives, uh, girlfriends that I haven't heard from in a while, talking with women uh, just generally about, well, what do you think about this? And you would hear story after story of the woman who discovered at age 39 uh, a, 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 a lump, uh, something that was off, something that was not right, and, and, and then the stories subsequent to that. Uh, the steps that she took as an individual with her doctor. Um, but, but again, the, the, the announcement that, well, we now have these guidelines that uh, this preventative screening task force has put in place, and everything that we thought we knew and understood about what we should be doing with our health has, has, has been unsettled. So, it brings us to, to the discussion today. We have an amendment brought to us by the, by the senator from, from Maryland. And uh, I would like to, to offer up uh, a little bit later an amendment, but I'd, I'd like to speak to that amendment now, if I may. Uh, I'm proposing this as a side-by-side -side to Senator Mikulski's am amendment. And this is designed to, to allow for an openness, a transparency, on, on preventive services, not just mammograms. I, I don't want to limit it to just mammograms because we know that preventive services in, in, in so many other aspects of our health are also equally key and also equally important. But what I'm looking to do with my amendment is to, to rely on the expertise not of a a, a government-appointed task force, but to rely on the expertise of, of medical organizations and, and the experts, whether they are uh, within the, the College of, of, um, of OBGYNs or, or um, uh, surgeons or uh, oncologists, rely on them and their expertise uh, to, to determine what services, what present preventive services should be covered. What, what we're seeking to do is allow for a level of information so that the individual can select the insurance coverage based on the recommendations 
by these major professional medical organizations on preventive health services, whether it's, it's mammography or, or cervical cancer screening. Um, I, I think we learned from the announcement from the USPSTF, the Preventative uh, Services Task Force, that when, when we have government um, engaging in, in the decisions as to our health uh, care and, and, and what level, what role they actually play, there's a great deal of concern and consternation. I've heard from many of my colleagues on here, well, that task force was wrong. We, we think that they have made a mistake in, in their recommendations. Well, what we're intending to do with this amendment is keep the government out of the health care decision making and allow the spotlight to be shown on the, the level of prevention coverage that patients will get under their health care plan. So rather than relying on, on unelected individuals, basically these are individuals that are, are appointed um, by an administration. Uh, to serve as part of this panel of 16 on the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, uh, my amendment specifies that all health plans must consult the recommendations and the guidelines of the professional medical organizations in determining what prevention benefits should be covered by all health insurance plans here in this country. And I, I, I know that. Um, at least those of us that are on the, the Federal Employees Health Benefits, we, we have an opportunity to, to subscribe to the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan. This is their booklet that is out for, for, this, for, for 2010 coming up. You, you look to their, um, this is under their standard and basic option plan, and, and you turn to the preventive care for adults that is, is covered. And they provide under this particular plan for the ca cancer diagnostic tests and screening procedures for colorectal cancer tests, for prostate cancer, for cervical cancer, for breast cancer, mammograms, ultrasound for um, abdominal aneurysm. There's a, there's a list that we can look to. But what we don't really see uh, laid out in, in this booklet or, or any of the other pamphlets that outline given plans out there is, well, uh, okay, on the, on the, for instance, the breast cancer tests, is there, is there an age restriction? I'm told under Blue Cross there is not, but it doesn't indicate that there. What do the experts recommend? It's not clear from what we receive. And so what my amendment would do in part is to allow for um, this information to be directly made available to, to patients, to individuals that are looking at the plans to make a determination as to what they will select. If, if you go to the, the, the websites of, of these um, medical professional, um, uh, professional medical organizations, for instance, the, uh, the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, they recommend that cervical cancer screening should begin at age 21 years, regardless of sexual history. Uh, cervical cytology screening recommended every two years for women between the ages of 21 years and 29 years. American Society of Clinical Oncology, um, as to the recommendations for, for mammography, urges all women beginning at age 40 to speak with their doctors about mammography to understand the benefits and potential risks. By age 50, at the latest, they should be receiving regular mammograms. The American College of Surgeons, in their recommendations recommend that women get a mammogram every year starting at age 40. As, as an individual that is looking to make a determination as to what are the experts saying out there, what is being recommended, I, I would like to know that this information is made available to me to help me make these decisions. So what our amendment would require is the, the plans would be required to provide this information directly to, to the individuals through the, the publications that they produce on an annual basis. So what we're talking about now is, it is the doctors, it is the specialists that will be recommending what preventative services to cover. 
not those of us here in Washington, D.C., in Congress, not the Secretary of Health and Social Services, who may or may not be, be a, a, a doctor or a medical professional, not a, a, a task force that has been appointed by uh, a, an administration. We're trying to take the politics out of this and really put it on the, the, the backs, if you will, of the medical professionals who know and understand this. This is where I think we want to be putting the emphasis. This is where we want to be relying is on the professionals, not the political uh, folks. Um, Additionally, my amendment ensures that the Secretary of Health and, and Human Services shall not use any recommendations made by the United States Preventive Services Task Force to deny coverage of any items or services. This is, this is the crux of so much that we're talking about right now with these latest recommendations that came out by USTSPF. The big concern by both Republicans and Democrats and, and everyone is, is that the insurance companies are going to be using these recommendations now to deny coverage to women under, four, uh, under 50 or to a woman who is over 50 if she wants to have a mammogram every year that, that only, she would only be allowed coverage for those mammograms every other year rather than an, on an annual basis. We want to take that, that, the, the, that away from the, the auspices, if you will, of the government to suggest that, that we, will, we will deny coverage based on the recommendations of these task this, this government task force is not something that I think most of us in this country are, are comfortable with. So we specify very clearly that the Secretary cannot use any recommendations from the USPSTF to deny coverage of any items or services. We also include in the amendment broad protections to prevent, um, the, 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 again, the bureaucrats, the, the government folks at the Department of, of Health and Human Services from denying care to patients based on the use of comparative effectiveness research. And then finally, we include a provision that ensures that the Secretary of Health and Human Services may not define or classify abortion or abortion services as preventive care uh, or as preventive services. Mr. President, this, this amendment is, is relatively straightforward. It relies essentially on the recommendation of, of practicing doctors as opposed to, to the bureaucrats, to the politicians, to those in office. My, my amendment addresses the concern that, uh, that the government will make coverage determinations for your health care decisions. Um, what we're doing here, quite simply, is making it very transparent, um, making clear the, that the preventive services that are recommended by the professional medical organizations um, are, are visible, are transparent. We require the insurance companies to disclose that information um, that, is, that is recommended and, um, uh, again, recommended by the professionals. I think that this is a, is a good compromise amendment. It, it, it basically it keeps the government out and it keeps the doctors in and it requires the insurance companies to disclose the information to the potential enrollees and, and allows for, uh, again, a transparency that I think to this point in time has been lacking. Uh, Mr. President, it's been suggested uh, by at least one other member uh, on the floor earlier that uh, my amendment would cost somewhere in the range of, I believe it was said, $30 billion. Uh, I, I would like to, to just note for the record, we have not yet received a score on this. We, we fully believe that it will be um, much, much less than has been suggested. I think uh, when the statement was made, it uh, it was not with a full uh, view of the amendment that we have before us and uh, is not consistent with that. So I, I, I did want to just acknowledge that um, as, we, as we begin the discussion on, on my amendment. I wanted to, I wanted to add, first I wanted to thank the Senator from Alaska for 
the tremendous work that she's done on this and the, the, the dozens of people that she's talked to over the last couple of days to try and come up with an amendment that would actually solve the problem that everybody's been talking about. I appreciate the Senator from Maryland recognizing this major flaw in the bill, and it is in the bill. Uh, the, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force is in the bill, and that's exactly the group that specified this new policy on mammograms that's upset people all across the country. It upset everybody so much that we have an amendment on the floor by the senator from Maryland uh, reacting to that and reacting to the fact that it is in the bill at the current time. So I appreciate the senator from Alaska coming up with a, a plan that actually is more comprehensive, I think, than the, than the amendment from the senator from Maryland because you've had a little bit longer to work on it. Um, and I appreciate the words that you've got in there that you cannot deny. Uh, you're on the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee with me, and I know we worked this issue in committee and uh, hoped that this kind of a realization would be made at that time. Uh, we had some amendments that said that they couldn't deny based on this or the uh, comparative effectiveness uh, or couldn't prohibit based on it. And we know from our amendments uh, that all of those failed meaning that there was probably some intention to deny or to prohibit based on these groups. And uh, so I appreciate you uh, bringing up the, the fact that, uh, that it is the caregivers that will have some say in this so that Washington can't become between you and your doctor. And uh, I, I wish you'd go into a little bit uh, some of your background from Alaska, because you and Alaska have been very involved in breast cancer for a long time. And uh, people ought to be aware of the kind of services that are available up there and what the cost of those are. Well, I, I appreciate the, uh, the question from my colleague from Wyoming. You know, coming from a rural state, that our health care costs um, are, are typically higher. And it's not just an issue of cost, but it's an issue of access. And particularly in my state, where most of our communities are not connected by road, it is very difficult to gain access to a provider. Um, it's even more difficult to gain access to, for instance, the mammography units. Um, I have uh, been involved in this issue just in terms of, of, of women's health and, and cancer screening for, for many decades now, primarily because my mother got started in it uh, back when I was still in high school and saw a need to provide for screening, breast cancer screening for women in rural areas where they couldn't af afford to fly in to, to, to town, as we would call it, uh, for the screenings. And so she um, in, engaged in, in an effort and continues to this day to uh, raise money for not only mobile mammography units, but to figure out how we move those units um, from village to village. And uh, essentially what they've been able to do over the years is you put that mobile mammography unit on a on uh, the back of a, of a barge and you take it up and down the river and you stop in every village, village and offer uh, free screenings for, for women. Um, fly it into a village where you're not on a river. And, and we have been making this effort again for decades and I think working, chipping away slowly at, uh, uh, at the issue of, of breast cancer. I think we recognize that in our state, particularly with our Alaska Native populations, we see higher levels of breast cancer than, than, we, sh when, than we would like. We're trying to reduce that. But when these, when these uh, recommendations came out um, several weeks ago from USTSPF, I, I will tell you, the, 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 the buzz around my state amongst women about, well, now what do I do? Where do I go? Do I need to go in for my screening? What should I do? There was an, there was an article, um, it was actually uh, in the news just, a, I guess, a couple weeks ago, and um, it, it cites a uh, comment from a doctor, and uh, her, 
her comment was that the new recommendations were, were confusing patients who usually come in for their, their annual screenings. And she says, my schedulers have called to schedule patients to come in for their follow-up mammogram, and they've been told, well, I don't have to do that now. This government group says, I don't have to do that. Now, Mr. Mr. President, my colleague from Wyoming, um, you know, maybe, maybe some don't, but what about those who are at risk? And these are the ones that I think we're continuing to hear from and, and say, please, add some clarity to this. Well, Mr. Mr. President, I, I know that there isn't any word that probably turns a family upside down quite as much as the word cancer. And it, it doesn't matter which form of cancer it is. It's, that, it's just drastic because you don't know all of the implications of it. Maybe someday we will. Maybe someday we'll know how, how people get it and we'll be able to cure it with a vaccine. But so far, what we have are some mechan mechanisms for putting it into rescission. And uh, one of the reasons I know how upsetting that is and, and how it turns the world upside down is three and a half years, three and three quarters years ago now, my wife was diagnosed with colon cancer. And uh, she'd had screenings, but she listened to her body. She said, something's the matter here, and she kept going to doctors. So even if they don't recommend the screenings, if your body is saying something is the matter, Pursue it until you're either convinced that nothing's the matter or a doctor finds what's the matter. That's the advice that she gives to, to everybody. And uh, these, these are things that need to be between the patient and the doctor. Um, now that she's in remission, one of the things that the doctor recommended was that she take Celebrex. That's something that's normally for arthritic pain. But what they found is that in some patients, that will keep polyps from growing that will turn into cancer in the colon. And... Uh, we definitely don't want that to reoccur again. And so she's taking that, but it's a, it's a constant fight with uh, making sure that that is an approved medication and that it, it can be done and that it will be paid for. Um, if that were just a task force recommendation, first of all, since she had the screening, they would say she doesn't have a problem. And later, she would die from it. But she was able to listen to her body, get the treatment that she needed, and uh, now is continuing to get the treatment without a task force saying, no, 99% of the people don't need that. Her doctor and she are able to determine what she needs um, on other screenings once you have cancer. There are other times that you need to have uh, MRIs, um, other kinds of tests run. That again has to be up to the doctor and the patient to determine how often those are. And again, I know from talking to a number of, of people that I know, not just ladies either, uh, that have had cancer, that once you've had cancer and you're in remission, you would actually prefer to have your screening just a little bit earlier for the mental reassurance that you get with it. Um, and, and again, from talking to people, and, and we talk to more now because we're trying to give some reassurance to them, um, when this terrible word comes up, um, that when they go to the doctor, one of the first things that happens is they, they weigh in, they take your blood pressure. And when you're waiting for a decision on how the blood test you got or the MRI or whatever it was is coming out, that blood pressure just goes through the roof. And uh, quite frequently, you can't leave the doctor's office until you've gotten the, you went there for the information. So, of course, you stay for the information. But they won't let you leave until they do the blood pressure test again to make sure that it goes down below the critical stage. That's how, that's how much impact this, this has on people. So I'm, I'm really glad that you did something that keeps, uh, that, that goes a little bit further, covers a few more things, and makes sure that people are going to have access to their doctor, to the tests that they need, and uh, not be relying on some government bureaucracy to say, well, in 99% of the cases, or 85% of the cases, who knows how far down they'd take it, depending on what the costs are. And uh, we, we just don't want that to happen. And I, I think that um, your amendment allows patients to get these preventive benefits and stops government bureaucrats and outside experts from ever blocking patients' access to those types of service. Um, I, I appreciate the senator from Maryland who put up an amendment. I don't, I don't think it meets that standard. 
They still rely on, on government experts called the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force to decide what preventive benefits should be covered under the private health insurance. And it's the same Preventative Services Task Force that made this decision that under the age of 50 should not receive annual mammograms. In fact, I think I even remember in there that uh, they weren't necessarily recommending self-examination. Most of the people that I know that are really young discovered it with self-examination. And uh, I certainly wouldn't want them to quit doing recommendation from somebody that doesn't understand them or their body uh, for doing that. Patients do want to receive preventative screenings. Uh, sometimes they're a little reluctant to do it because nobody wants the possibility of hearing that word given to them. So um, Americans should be able to get screened for high blood pressure and diabetes when the doctor recommends they get these tests. I think you and I agree that they should be able to get colonoscopies, prostate exams, mammograms so they can prevent deadly cancers from progressing to the point where they are no longer curable. Many of these diseases are preventable or curable or put into remission if they're discovered early enough. I think we agree that Senator Mikulski's goal that all Americans should be able to get preventive benefits, uh, but we, we disagree that her amendment achieves that stated goal. Her amendment does not ensure access to mammograms for women that are under the age of 50. And part of that I'm taking from an Associated Press article. As most Americans know, last month the Preventive Services Task Force revised the recommendation for screening for breast cancer, advising women between the ages of 40 and 49 against receiving routine mammograms, and women ages 50 and over to receive a mammogram just once every two years. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force lowered its grade for these screenings to a C. And that sparked the political firestorm as many women became confused about what services they could get and when they could get them. And the health care bills before Congress further confused the issue because they rely heavily on the recommendations of that task force. That's what's in the bill. The underlying Reed bill says, and the Mikulski amendment restates, that all health plans must cover preventive services that receive an A or a B grade from the task force. Let's see, we just said that was a C grade. Because breast cancer screenings for women under the age of 50 are no longer classified by the task force as A or B plans, they would not cover those services. So McKenna, Senator Mikulski, the Senator from Maryland's uh, drafted amendment to try to fix this problem, but it, I think, confuses the matter some more, and I appreciate the effort that you've gone to to, to try and clarify that and expand it to some other areas. Um, so, and, and not add another layer of bureaucracy by saying that all services and screenings uh, must be covered by health plans. However, um, the previous amendment doesn't have any, any guidelines that are specifically for women or prevention. So, If, if I may just comment on, on your last statement there, because I think this is, this is very important for people to understand. Uh, there's been much said about the Mikulski Amendment and, and what it does or, or doesn't do, but it is very important for women to understand that the Mikulski Amendment will not address, will not provide for those mammograms for women that are younger than age 50. Her amendment specifically provides that uh, uh, it is evidence-based items or services that have, have, in effect, a rating of A or B in the current recommendations of the United States Preventative Services Task Force. So you go to the task force report, and as you have noted, um, women who fall between the ages of 40 and 49 receive a grade of a C, um, uh, and the recommendation is specifically do not screen routinely. Individualized decision to begin biennial screening according to the patient's context and values. But they have received a C uh, designation by USTSPF. So according to the Mikulski Amendment, those women who are younger than, than 50 years of age will not be eligible or will not be uh, covered under the mandatory uh, uh, screening requirement that she has set forth in her amendment. I think that's where she was trying to go, was to ensure that these recommendations would not um, be used to deny coverage. 
And she adds a paragraph stating that nothing shall preclude health plans from covering additional services recommended by the task force that are either not an A or a B recommendation. But the amendment does not require plans to cover services that are not an A or a B. So if, in other words, if you are 45 years of age, you are in this C category, and uh, the amendment does not require, then, that your preventive screening services be covered. So for those women who are in this, this age group, when, you know, uh, Congressman, uh, excuse me, Congresswoman uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz just went through a recent bout of, of cancer, and that was diagnosed at, at age uh, uh, 41, as I believe. You know, for those women that fall in this category, this amendment that the senator from Maryland has introduced does not address the concerns that have been raised by these recommendations coming out of this preventive task force. And uh, again, I think we need to, to understand that what this amendment specifically allows for is is first dollar coverage for uh, immunizations for 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 children, um, uh, children's health services, uh, as as outlined with the HRSA, the the Human Resources Services um, guidelines. Um, but in fact, the the requirement again to provide for screening coverage for women who who are not in this A or B category. In other words, anybody younger than 50, you need to understand that you are not covered through this. Our amendment, through, through allowing for a, a level of transparency, ensuring that when you go to, to obtain your insurance, you can see very clearly what the medical organization, professional medical organizations recommend are the guidelines, and then what your insurer is, is proposing to offer you for your coverage. And if it's not coverage that you like, then uh, shop around. This is, this is what this in insurance exchange is supposed to be all about. And, and Mr. President, I want to congratulate the Senator from Alaska also. Uh, isn't, isn't it true that your amendment ensures that the Secretary of Health and Human Services won't be able to deny uh, any of these services based on any recommendation. Um, that's one of the things that we've been concerned about. Again, that's an unelected bureaucrat who could uh, uh, come between you and your doctor and your health care. And uh, I, I think, I, I know that you've covered that in your amendment too, and I, I do appreciate it. Well, it, it states very clearly on the second page that uh, the Secretary shall not use any recommendation made by the United States Preventative Services Task Force to deny coverage of an item or service by a group health plan or health insurance issuer. Um, so yes, we make very clear that these recommendations from the, the US TSPF cannot be used to deny coverage. Now, I, I think the 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 opportunity to have uh, medical professionals, as is, is um, uh, this USGSPF is comprised of, we should have, uh, or we should have an entity that is kind of looking out and seeing what best practices are. But then that entity should not be the one that, that causes a determination as to whether or not coverage is going to be offered. You can use that as a resource, most certainly, just as we use as a resource the recommendation from, um, uh, from say, for instance, the, the American Congress of Obstetricians and, and Gynecologists, the American College of Surgeons, the American Society of Clinical on Oncology. But it's not going to be the determining factor, and I think this is where we, we need to make that separation, and where my amendment separates from, from Senator Mikulski's. And, uh, Mr. President, I also appreciate that you uh, make sure that they can't deny care based on comparative effectiveness research, which actually was part of the stimulus bill that was run through at that, that point in time. And uh, finally, that you, uh, your amendment includes a common sense provision that would 
prohibit the Secretary from ever determining that abortion is a preventative service. So I hope all of my colleagues, whether they're pro-life or pro-choice, would support this change. And uh, that would ensure that the controversial issues are, don't sidetrack the debate on the preventive issues. Because we're, what we're talking about is the preventive issues. And I appreciate your covering that. Well, and I, I, I'm glad that you mentioned the, the issue uh, of the abortion um, uh, services. There is, I think there's a, 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 a vagary, a vagueness in, in the amendment that Senator Mikulski has offered. Um, some have suggested that it would allow uh, those in Human Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, to define abortion as a, as a preventative test, uh, which could provide health insurance plans uh, that then be mandated to cover it. And that has generated some, some concern, obviously. Uh, some have uh, opposed the amendment, saying that if Congress were to grant any executive branch entity sweeping authority to define services that private plans must then cover, merely by declaring a given service to constitute preventive care, then that authority could be employed in the future to require all health plans to cover abortions. So all we are doing in, in my amendment is just making very clear there are no vagaries, uh, there is no second guessing, it just makes very clear that uh, the Secretary cannot make that determination that, uh, uh, that preventive services are, are construed to include abortion services. Well, Mr. President, as I said before, my, my wife says that uh, she probably never mentioned the word colon twice in her whole life. And since then, she's become an encyclopedia for people that uh, have a, a very similar problem. And she had had a colonoscopy just a short time before she was still having problems. And they had said there is no problem, but she kept getting it checked until she found that there was a problem. And so people need to listen to their bodies, and they need to listen to their doctors, and they shouldn't have a bureaucrat coming in between that. So thank you for all your effort on this. Well, I, I thank you for the, the dialogue here today. I think um, this is an important part of, of our discussion as we um, debate health care reform on, on the floor. We've had good conversations already yesterday and today about uh, the, the cuts to Medicare, the impact um, uh, that, that we will feel uh, as, as a nation if, if these substantive cuts uh, advance. But I think this discussion, and we're, we're narrowing it so much on, on what the recommendations have been from this task force, but I think it is a, a good preview of, of, of what, um, what the American people can expect if we move in the direction of, of government-run health care, of, of bureaucrats, whether it's the Secretary of, of Health and Social Services or whether it's task forces that, task forces that have been appointed uh, by those in the administration who are then able to make that determination as to what is best for you and your health care and your family's health care. And I, I, I think the, the discussion that we have had today about ensuring that it's not, it's not best left to these, these entities, these appointed entities to make these determinations, but let's leave it to, or let's allow the information to come to us from the medical professionals. Uh, Senator Coburn has, has spoken so, so eloquently on the floor about relying on those who really know and understand, who live this, who practice this, rather than us as, as politicians who want to be doctors. I don't want to be a doctor. I want to be able to rely on the good judgment of a provider that I trust. And I want him to be able, him or he or she, to be able to make those decisions based on his understanding of me and my health care needs and what is best for me and what the best practices are that are out there, rather than him having a task force telling him, that's the protocol for Lisa. She's 52. She's able to get a mammogram every other year now. I want to know that it's me and my doctor that are making these decisions. Um, I, I would hope that uh, members would take a look at, at the amendment that, uh, that I will offer up and, and consider how it allows for um, truly that kind of openness, that kind of transparency 
um, and gives, gives individuals uh, the freedom of choice in their health care that I think we all want. With that, I, I thank my colleague from Wyoming, and uh, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from, Senator from Montana is recognized.